Hi friends, my name is Benjamin and today I will tell you five true crime stories about the most dangerous male killers. Donna Ellen Brown was born November 10th, 1963 in Florida. Donna was the oldest of three girls. She was beautiful, smart, and successful in her career as an operating room technician. She met Mark Winger, a nuclear engineer, and they married in a traditional Jewish ceremony in 1989. Donna and Mark seemed to be a picture-perfect couple. They were successful and owned a nice home in a nice neighborhood. However, not every story ends perfectly like the beginning. On the 29th of August, 1995, a Tuesday, Mark Winger contacted 911 at 4.27 p.m., reporting an incident where a man was harming his wife. Mark, residing in Springfield, Illinois, with his 31-year-old wife Donna Winger, informed the dispatcher that he had shot the man. Upon the police's arrival, they discovered Donna in a critical condition, having sustained seven blows to the head with a hammer. A man, identified as 27-year-old Roger Harrington, was found in a critical state beside Donna, having suffered two gunshot wounds to the head. Both victims were promptly taken to the hospital, where Roger succumbed shortly after arrival, and Donna passed away a few minutes later without regaining consciousness. The police secured the residence, finding no signs of forced entry. Mark, visibly distressed, explained to the police that he shot the man upon witnessing the attack on his wife. Mark detailed that he was in the basement on the treadmill when he heard noises upstairs, prompting him to investigate. He discovered their adopted baby Bailey on the bed in the master bedroom, but found no trace of Donna. Upon hearing more noises downstairs, Mark retrieved his handgun from the bedroom nightstand and proceeded towards the dining room. According to Mark, he observed a man wielding a hammer in the hallway, assaulting Donna. Mark shot the man, and upon an attempt to rise, Mark fired a second shot. The police located the blood-covered hammer used in the assault, which belonged to both Donna and Mark. Additionally, a .45 caliber semi-automatic handgun, confirmed by Mark as the weapon used, was found in the house. When Mark inquired about the identity of the man who attacked his wife, the police confirmed it was Roger. Mark then stated, That's the man who has been harassing my wife this week. As per Mark's account, Donna had traveled to visit her parents in Florida six days prior. Her mother dropped her off at the airport, and a driver hired through a limousine company in St. Louis, Missouri, named Roger, transported her back to Springfield. According to Mark, Donna shared that during the two-hour drive, Roger was excessively talkative and exhibited flirtatious behavior, expressing a preference for older women and extending invitations to intimate parties. The conversation took a darker turn when he disclosed hearing a disturbing voice named Dom instructing him to harm people. Mark informed the police, stating, The guy scared her. She said that he was very frightening. He said things about killing people, setting car bombs, mutilating people. Upon Donna's return to Springfield, she informed her family about the unsettling encounter, expressing fear and discomfort due to the alarming conversation and erratic driving. Mark recounted to the police that despite safely reaching home, the situation persisted. Donna received numerous peculiar phone calls, and based on the timing, she suspected Roger as the caller. In the house, the police discovered a note describing Donna's unsettling car ride. Mark also informed the police that he reported the incident to the limousine company where Roger was employed, resulting in Roger's suspension, which Mark believed might have escalated the situation. The police discovered Roger's car parked outside the Winger house, facing the wrong direction. Upon inspection, they found various weapons inside, including a knife and a tire iron. Authorities concluded that Mark acted in self-defense, and they decided not to press charges considering the traumatic circumstances. The case was closed with the acknowledgement that Mark had already endured significant distress. Mark appeared profoundly affected by the events. Mark and Donna had moved to Springfield right after their wedding, where they found happiness. Donna worked at Memorial Medical Center as an operating room technician 
while Mark served as an engineer for the Illinois Department of Nuclear Safety. Despite facing challenges, such as Donna's initial distress upon learning she couldn't conceive, their lives took a positive turn when a doctor informed them of a teenager willing to put her baby up for adoption. Donna and Mark gladly welcomed their adopted daughter, Bailey, on June 1, 1995. Following Donna's tragic death, Mark, now responsible for the infant Bailey, opted to stay in the same house. To help with childcare, he hired a nanny, Rebecca Simic. Unexpectedly, a few months into her employment, Rebecca discovered she was pregnant with Mark's child. They named their daughter Anna. Subsequently, Mark and Rebecca got married just over a year after Donna's passing. Mark made the decision to sell the house and severed ties with Donna's family. The new family, consisting of Mark, Rebecca, Bailey, and Anna, moved to a different town. Over time, they expanded their family further with the addition of two more children, Maggie and Ben. In 1999, Donna's close friend, Deanne Schultz, revealed to the police that she had an affair with Mark while Donna was still alive, and Mark made troubling statements that stayed with her. According to Deanne, Mark expressed, it would be easier for us to be together if Donna just died. All you'd have to do is come in and find the body. Deanne also shared disturbing information that raised concerns for the authorities. When Mark learned about Donna's unsettling experience during the car ride back to Springfield, he allegedly told Deanne that he needed to have the driver in his house. This revelation prompted the police to reopen Donna's case. However, they discovered with disappointment that some evidence had gone missing. Mark initiated a civil lawsuit against BART Transportation, seeking accountability for Donna's death due to Roger's actions. As Roger was an employee of BART Transportation at the time of Donna's death, his attorney requested access to the evidence and files for the civil suit. Despite this, the police managed to retain some files and accessed photos taken on the day of the incident. These images depicted Donna and Roger on the ground before being taken to the hospital. However, the positions of the bodies seemed inconsistent with Mark's earlier account given to the police years ago. At the time, Mark informed the police that he encountered Roger kneeling beside Donna's head, assaulting her with a hammer, prompting him to open fire. Mark claimed that Roger fell backward, and attempting to rise, Mark shot him again. According to Mark's description, Roger's position should have placed his feet near Donna's head, facing the opposite direction. However, upon reviewing the photos taken by the police upon their arrival, it appeared that both Roger and Donna were on the ground facing the same direction. This inconsistency led the police, for the first time, to entertain the suspicion that Mark might have been involved in his wife's murder. The question of why Roger was at their house on that day remained unanswered. Simultaneously, during the civil suit involving Mark, a potential explanation emerged. BART Transportation enlisted a blood spatter expert, whose analysis suggested that the blood spatter patterns indicated Mark's involvement in the deaths of both Donna and Roger. As the police delved deeper into the investigation, they uncovered additional incriminating evidence. Roger's roommate, Susan Collins, informed law enforcement that she overheard Roger arranging a meeting with someone on the day he was killed. Furthermore, a note written on a bank deposit slip inside Roger's car was discovered, containing Mark's name, address, and a specified time. Susan shared with the police that Roger had mentioned agreeing to meet Mark to resolve issues stemming from Mark's complaints about Roger's driving and the concerning conversation he had with Donna. Roger left the house at 3.30 p.m., and the note indicated a meeting time of 4.30 p.m., aligning with the prosecution's belief that Mark had asked him to come to the house at that time. On August 23, 2001, Mark was arrested and charged with two counts of murder. The prosecution argued that Mark was responsible for both Donna and Roger's deaths. They contended that Mark desired to remove Donna from his life but didn't want to risk losing custody of their adopted daughter, Bailey, and therefore avoided divorce. Allegedly, Mark saw an opportunity when he learned about Donna's troubles with Roger, viewing it as a perfect chance to eliminate Donna 
and frame an innocent man. The prosecution proposed that Mark contacted Roger, whom he had never met before that day, and asked him to come to the house. Upon Roger's arrival, Mark allegedly let him inside and fatally shot him. The absence of forced entry at the residence supported this narrative. The prosecution further claimed that Donna, who was in the master bedroom with Bailey, heard the gunshot, went downstairs, and was subsequently beaten to death with a hammer by Mark before he called 911. To establish that Mark had lured Roger to the house, the prosecution presented the note found in Roger's car, which contained Mark's name and address. The jury learned that although Roger had weapons in his car, he didn't bring them into the house and instead used Donna's hammer in the attack. This raised questions about Roger's intentions if he had indeed gone there with the purpose of assaulting Donna. The court was also informed about the inconsistencies between the location Mark claimed Roger was in when he shot him and the photos taken on the same day, which contradicted Mark's account. Deanne's testimony played a crucial role, shedding light on the statements Mark allegedly made expressing a desire for Donna's death. The court learned that four days before the murders, on August 25, 1995, Mark had asked his co-worker, Candace Bolden, about the fate of his adopted daughter if Donna were to die. Later that day, Mark contacted Ray Duffy, the president of the transport company where Roger worked, to complain about Donna's ride. A few days after, Mark called again, seeking the driver's full name and expressing a desire to discuss the matter directly with him. During the trial, the court was informed about the severe injuries sustained by Donna and Roger. When the police arrived at the house, Donna was found lying face down on the floor, and Roger was on his back. Donna's cause of death was determined to be brain trauma, resulting from multiple blunt force injuries to the head consistent with hammer strikes. Roger died from brain trauma caused by gunshot wounds to the top left side of his head and above his left eyebrow with additional contusions on his chest from hammer strikes. The defense contended that Roger's erratic decisions that day, including the choice of weapon and the peculiar parking of his car, indicated mental instability, a claim they asserted was evident from his behavior during the car ride with Donna. Regarding the position of the bodies and the photos, the defense argued that although Donna and Roger were critical when paramedics arrived, they weren't deceased, and the paramedics might have moved them in attempts to save their lives. However, the paramedics denied moving them before the photos were taken, and Mark did not testify during the trial. Concerning Deanne's testimony, the defense claimed she was motivated by personal feelings of rejection. While Mark admitted to having an affair with Deanne, he moved on with the nanny he hired soon after Donna's death, marrying her shortly thereafter. The defense asserted that Deanne harbored resentment for not being chosen by Mark to marry. Despite the defense's arguments, the jury found Mark guilty of two counts of first-degree murder, and he received a life sentence without the possibility of parole. In 2005, while still serving time for the first-degree murder convictions, Mark became involved in a murder-for-hire plot that was thwarted. Allegedly, he attempted to orchestrate hits on Deanne for testifying against him and on Jeffrey Gelman, a childhood friend, for not posting his million-dollar bail. Investigators discovered 19 handwritten pages outlining Mark's desires for Deanne. He reportedly wanted her kidnapped and coerced into writing a statement recanting her testimony, asserting Mark's innocence before planning for her demise. Mark claimed in court that these notes merely represented a fantasy he never intended to carry out. Despite Mark's assertion, he was found guilty of solicitation of murder and received an additional 35-year prison sentence. Donna's mother, Sarah Jane, and Donna's stepfather, Ira Drescher, expressed their overwhelming response to the evidence against Mark, emphasizing the brutality of Donna's murder. What's so hard to understand is the way he murdered Donna was so vicious and so violent. Throughout these legal proceedings, Mark has maintained his innocence. Deanne, who provided testimony against him, was granted immunity and faced no charges as a result. Leslie London Newlander, a 61-year-old resident of Fayetteville and longtime Syracuse, New York resident, 
appeared to lead a content life with her husband, Dr. Robert Newlander, a highly regarded gynecologist and their children. She actively contributed to the community, participating in local charities and assisting those in need. However, on the morning of September 17, 2012, Leslie found herself in a dire situation. Her daughter, 23-year-old Jenna Newlander, urgently called 911, reporting that her mother had fallen in the shower and required immediate medical attention. Jenna recounted her father's plea for help, stating that he had discovered Leslie on the bathroom floor, bleeding. Paramedics promptly arrived at the couple's spacious residence, where they observed blood in various areas of the master bedroom, including pooled on the rug and spattered on the wall near the bed. Surprisingly, Leslie was found about 60 feet away from the reported fall site, as Robert had carried her there to administer CPR, disregarding Jenna's objections. Despite these efforts, it was too late, and Leslie was declared dead at the scene. Upon police arrival, Leslie was not discovered in the bathroom, but on the bedroom floor. Dr. Robert Newlander, her husband, explained to the police that he had moved her from the bathroom to the bedroom to administer CPR. Despite the paramedics' efforts, Leslie had suffered a severe and fatal head injury, leading to her being pronounced dead at the scene. During the police interview, Robert recounted discovering Leslie on the bathroom floor and subsequently moving her to the bedroom for CPR. Blood was found in various parts of the bedroom, including the rug and the wall next to the bed. The medical examiner determined that Leslie's cause of death was blunt force head injuries resulting from a fall from standing height. The belief was that she slipped in the shower and struck her head on the stone shower bench. The incident was deemed an accident, and the case was closed. The passing of Leslie came as not only a surprise to her family, but also as a profound shock to the broader community. The Newlanders, a well-regarded family in the region, were deeply liked. Robert, who served as a gynecologist and obstetrician in Syracuse, had built trust with numerous residents who had been patrons of his practice. Over a span of 28 years, he and Leslie shared their lives, raising four children. Emily and Brian, from Robert's previous marriage, were joined by Ari and Jenna, born to Robert and Leslie. The community in Syracuse was well aware of the Newlanders' extensive philanthropy as they generously contributed both their time and resources to various charitable causes. Leslie's untimely death marked a tragic event for those who were acquainted with her. After Leslie's death, Robert sold the house and moved to a new one. Despite the fact that the case was closed and Robert moved, people in the community began to talk. There were rumors circulating that a lot of blood was found in the house and that Leslie's injuries were far more severe than would have been expected from a slip and fall in the shower. Was Leslie's death really the result of an accident? Other rumors were circulating as well. There were whispers suggesting that the Newlander's marriage was not as stable as it seemed, with one person even claiming that Leslie had plans to lease a new apartment on the day of her death. The police also received an anonymous letter with the following content. There are doubts about him being the good guy everyone thinks he is. Leslie was trying to break away from this guy. Dr. Mary Jimbelic, the county's former chief medical examiner until her retirement in 2009, shared a close friendship with the Newlanders. However, some mutual acquaintances approached her, questioning whether she believed Leslie's death was truly accidental. Dr. Jumbalik became troubled when she examined the medical report, realizing the extent of Leslie's injuries. Leslie had sustained a deeply penetrating wound to the back of her head, so severe that blood had accumulated in her eye. This type of injury was typically associated with incidents like car accidents or heavy object beatings. Dr. Jumbelik informed the police that, in her professional opinion, Leslie's death was not accidental, but rather a homicide, resulting from blunt head trauma inflicted during an assault. Prompted by Dr. Jumbelik's assessment and the anonymous letter, the police reopened the case. Subsequent investigations confirmed the marriage troubles, with Leslie and Robert sleeping in separate bedrooms at the time of her death. 
Additionally, it was revealed that Robert's once thriving medical practice was facing financial challenges, no longer enjoying the same level of success. Despite Robert selling the house after Leslie's death, the police revisited the scene, this time considering it as the potential site of a homicide rather than a simple slip and fall accident. The second search uncovered overlooked details, such as blood at the back of the headboard on the bed and blood spatter on the blinds behind the bed. Subsequently, the police approached Robert with a request to answer some questions, to which he agreed. When questioned about the rumors circulating regarding marital issues, Robert acknowledged the problems, but insisted that there was no animosity and they still maintained a good relationship. He mentioned that the night before Leslie's death, they had even gone out for dinner with their children, Ari and Jenna. Providing a detailed account of the morning of Leslie's death, Robert described his routine, including a jog at Green Lakes and buying coffee for Leslie on his way back, a daily ritual. According to Robert, upon his return, Leslie was already in the shower. An hour later, around 8.25 a.m., he opened the bathroom door to check on her, discovering her on the floor. In response, he called out to Jenna and instructed her to call 911. Despite Jenna's plea during the emergency call not to move Leslie, citing the potential risk of a broken neck, Robert adjusted Leslie's position, finding it challenging to perform CPR in the bathroom. Following Robert's response to police inquiries, a re-evaluation of the evidence with a focus on the blood traces in the house and the gravity of Leslie's injuries led to Robert's arrest. He was subsequently charged with murder. Robert entered a plea of not guilty. The prosecution's narrative centered on the assertion that Robert had killed Leslie hours before making the 911 call and even before his morning jog. They argued that he assaulted Leslie in the bedroom using an unknown weapon, then moved her to the bathroom, where he struck her head against the shower bench to create the appearance of a slip and fall. The prosecution contended that Robert called Jenna at that point to make it seem like he had just discovered Leslie in the bathroom. Choosing to carry her back to the bedroom, despite Jenna's objections, was a deliberate move to explain the trail of blood from the bedroom to the bathroom. During the trial, the court heard from the Newlander's housekeeper, who noticed unfamiliar sheets on the bed, leading the prosecution to suggest that Robert disposed of the bloodied sheets and potentially the murder weapon during his morning jog. The key evidence presented by the prosecution focused on blood spatter found in the house. The spatter was discovered on the headboard, nightstand, blinds behind the bed, and the south wall located approximately seven feet south of the bed. The prosecution emphasized the spatter on the south wall, asserting it was impact spatter caused by Leslie's blood, indicative of a forceful blow if she were struck with an object. Expert testimony was called upon to explain this impact spatter to the jury. The court received testimony concerning the injuries sustained by Leslie. According to the medical examiner, Leslie's demise resulted from a complex and comminuted skull fracture, likely inflicted by multiple blows. Notably, bruises were found on her fingers, arms, and nose, accompanied by abrasions on both sides of her face. Initially considering it an accident from a slip in the shower, the medical examiner revised his opinion upon discovering additional evidence, now concluding it was a homicide. The court was informed that Leslie suffered at least two blows to her skull, with one wound inconsistent with her head striking a straight edge like a stone shower bench. The prosecution contended that the initial blow to Leslie's head was caused by an unidentified object. While Leslie exhibited injuries to her face and upper body, there were none below her waist. The court learned that if she had slipped and fallen, lower body bruising would likely have occurred. The prosecution urged the jury to find Robert guilty, emphasizing that Leslie's last moments were marked by a desperate struggle for her life before succumbing to a fatal beating and being callously discarded in her own shower. The defense presented its argument that Leslie's death was accidental, emphasizing her struggle with vertigo, a disorder causing dizziness. Testimony from her personal trainer revealed a recent worsening of Leslie's vertigo, a condition acknowledged to run in the family by her sister, Joanne London Leslie, who also attested to experiencing it. 
The defense addressed the prosecution's argument that the blood spatter showed that Leslie was attacked in the bedroom. It was their case that if there was a lot of blood spatter, the paramedics may have caused it by removing their gloves. The first responders probably had blood on their hands and that the gloves were just peeled off. And in so doing, the blood flies from the gloves and you don't have an impact, but you have a cast off. Additionally, the defense raised the possibility that Robert himself, while attempting CPR, may have contributed to the blood spatter by removing his blood-stained shirt. However, they argued that the investigation's lack of professionalism made it challenging to interpret the spatter accurately. The court was informed that insufficient close-up images of the blood existed, and some blood, located behind the headboard and blinds, was collected months after Leslie's death, even after Robert had vacated the premises. Dr. Daniel Spitz, a medical examiner testifying for the defense, asserted his belief that Leslie's head wound resulted from a fall in the shower where she struck her head on the stone bench. Despite Robert not testifying, his daughter Jenna took the stand. She described her 911 call and recounted the events of that fateful morning, revealing that she had been with her mother until 2 a.m. Jenna contradicted the housekeeper's claim about the sheets, insisting they remained unchanged from the police's arrival. Jenna attested to witnessing her father remove a blood-stained shirt during CPR in the bedroom, although the shirt itself was never located. She emphatically asserted her belief that her mother's death was accidental, given her presence in the house at the time. After a three-day deliberation, the jury rendered a verdict, finding Robert guilty of second-degree murder and tampering with physical evidence. The defense asked the court to sentence him to the minimum term. At the sentencing hearing, Leslie's sister, Joanne London Leslie, spoke on the family's behalf. Had any of us even slightly suspected foul play of any sort, we would not be here today on Bob's behalf. Robert also spoke in court. My head is unbowed by the verdict of this court, for an innocent man has been wrongfully convicted. I would not and did not take a life. I love my wife Leslie very much, and I mourn her every day, now and forever. Robert was sentenced to 20 years to life in prison, and as he walked away, Jenna shouted after him, Daddy, I love you. You're innocent. The case took an unexpected turn after the verdict when an alternate juror reached out to Robert's lawyer, expressing concerns about potential juror bias. It was revealed that one of the jurors who had voted to convict Robert of murder, juror number 12, Johanna Lorraine, had exchanged approximately 7,000 text messages with family and friends during the trial. Several hundred of these messages involved inquiries about the case, a clear violation of the rules that prohibit jurors from discussing the trial. Robert's defense team, armed with this new information, initiated an appeal of his conviction. The court learned that Johanna Lorraine had both received and sent numerous texts about the case, including one from her father instructing her to make sure he's guilty. Another text asked if she had seen the scary man. Additionally, it was discovered that she accessed media websites covering the trial, raising concerns about external influences impacting her judgment as a juror. As a consequence of the text exchanges leading to concerns of juror bias, Robert's conviction was overturned and a new trial was ordered. After spending three years in prison, he was released on bail awaiting the commencement of the new trial. However, the scheduling of the new trial faced numerous delays, with adjournments attributed in part to the challenges posed by the coronavirus pandemic. The prosecution encountered an early setback for the new trial, losing one of their key witnesses as their medical examiner passed away. This loss is significant, particularly considering the importance placed on the testimony of Dr. Liesma during the first trial. The fact that the jury from the initial trial requested Dr. Liesma's testimony to be read back to them during deliberations suggests the weight they attributed to that testimony in determining Robert's guilt. In Dr. Robert's second murder trial in early 2022, notable differences emerged compared to the first trial. Two significant changes were apparent. Additional incriminating evidence was presented against him, and Jenna Newlander did not take the stand. 
During re-examination in 2021, forensic analysis revealed mummified fat tissue from Leslie's head on the headboard of the couple's bed, reinforcing the narrative of Dr. Roberts' alleged assault on her. Despite Jenna's 911 call being played in court, as it was during the first trial, the defense chose not to call her as a witness to testify in support of her father this time. Ultimately, the outcome of the legal proceedings mirrored that of the initial trial. Dr. Robert was convicted on March 17, 2022. Subsequently, he was sentenced to 20 years to life in prison on May 2nd, receiving credit for the time already served. Michelle Young was born in 1977 in the vibrant and harmonious city of New York. Possessing an outgoing personality from a young age, she grew up with ambitions of pursuing a career in finance. After completing high school, Michelle took a significant step toward realizing her dream by attending a university in Raleigh. By 2001, she had achieved financial success and during this time crossed paths with a man who would greatly impact her personal life. On her 24th birthday, while celebrating with friends, Michelle encountered Jason Young. Jason, also an alum of the same university, shared a similar academic background and interests with Michelle. This connection led to a romantic relationship, eventually culminating in their marriage. On the 3rd of November 2006, a Friday, Jason Young requested his sister-in-law, Meredith Fisher, to visit his residence and retrieve some eBay printouts. The purpose was to prevent his 29-year-old wife, Michelle Young, from discovering them. Jason informed Meredith that he had printed materials related to coach bags, intending to purchase one for Michelle as an anniversary gift. However, he forgot to put them away and was concerned that Michelle might stumble upon them. At the time, Jason was away on a business trip. Meredith agreed to pick up the printouts and was told they were located in the home office upstairs. Jason, Michelle, and their two-year-old daughter, Cassidy, lived together on Birchleaf Drive in Raleigh, North Carolina, with Michelle being five months pregnant with their second child, a baby boy. Around 1 p.m., Meredith arrived at the house, entering through the broken garage door and then through the unlocked kitchen door. Upon entering, she noticed the house was chilly. Michelle's car was in the garage, and in the kitchen, Meredith found Michelle's purse and keys on the counter. Concerned, she called out Michelle's name, but received no response. Despite hearing Michelle's dog, Mr. G, whimpering, Meredith couldn't locate him and was unsure of his whereabouts. Heading upstairs, Meredith noticed what she initially thought was red hair dye near the top of the staircase. Upon reaching the top, she discovered her sister lying face down on the floor. Contrary to her initial assumption, the red substance was not hair dye, but blood. Michelle had been brutally beaten to death, lying in a pool of blood when Meredith made the grim discovery. Immediately calling 911, Meredith found that Cassidy, Michelle's two-year-old daughter, had been hiding under the covers on the bed and was physically unharmed. Cassidy, asking for band-aids, mentioned that her mother had boo-boos everywhere. While speaking to the operator, Meredith expressed Cassidy's claim that there might be someone else in the house. When questioned about Michelle's issues, Meredith mentioned occasional fights between Michelle and her husband Jason, clarifying that they were not excessively severe. She also informed the operator about the presence of blood footprints throughout the house, including those of Michelle's daughter. Upon the arrival of paramedics, Michelle was confirmed dead and it was evident that she had been deceased for a significant period. Cassidy, Michelle's daughter, was examined, revealing dried blood on her toenails and the bottom of her pajama pants. Fortunately, she had not sustained any physical injuries. Meredith promptly informed her mother, Linda Fisher, about Michelle's tragic death. Linda, in turn, contacted Jason's mother, Pat Young, to relay the devastating news. Meanwhile, Jason was en route from Virginia to Pat's house in Brevard. Upon his arrival, his stepfather broke the news about Michelle. Subsequently, Meredith called Jason, revealing that Michelle's death had been ruled a homicide. Upon learning of his wife's death, Jason, accompanied by some family members, 
hurriedly drove to Raleigh. During the journey, friends informed him that the police had inquired about any marital problems Michelle might have had. Opting to remain silent until he retained legal representation, Jason declined to answer police questions upon his arrival in Raleigh, citing advice from his counsel. The police discovered traces of blood on the doorknob connecting the kitchen to the garage, later confirming it to be Michelle's blood. Despite a broken garage door which had been in that condition for some time, there was no evident sign of forced entry. Notably, Michelle's jewelry box had two drawers removed, and some valuable items, including her wedding and engagement rings, were missing. However, the house was not otherwise disturbed or ransacked. When Michelle's lifeless body was located, she was clad in sweatpants and a zip-up sweatshirt. Her body exhibited signs of discoloration, coldness, and stiffness. The scene revealed a significant amount of her blood, with blood stains on the bedroom walls and inside the closet. Michelle was found adjacent to a closet labeled His Closet, and a small doll was discovered beside her head. The police sought to question Jason regarding his whereabouts on the night of November 2nd and the early hours of November 3rd. Despite reluctance and non-cooperation from Jason, investigators found that on November 2nd, he left Raleigh, heading towards Virginia for a sales call scheduled at 10 a.m. on November 3rd in Clintwood. On the evening of November 2nd, Michelle had plans to spend time with her friend Shelley Shad. According to Shelley, she arrived at Michelle's house around 6.30 p.m., finding Jason still present. When offered to join them for dinner, Jason declined, mentioning his plan to eat at a Cracker Barrel on his way to Galax, Virginia. Jason had booked a room in Galax for the night, intending to stay there before driving to Clintwood the next morning for the sales call. Shelley informed the police that after Jason's departure, Michelle bathed Cassidy and put her to bed, after which they watched Gray's anatomy. During their time together, Michelle confided in Shelley about recent disagreements with Jason, particularly regarding holiday plans. Michelle desired her mother Linda to stay with them from Thanksgiving through Christmas, a proposition that Jason was not enthusiastic about. Investigations revealed that on that night, Jason made seven phone calls to Michelle. Shelley, Michelle's friend, shared with the police her unsettling feeling of being watched that night, prompting her to ask Michelle to accompany her to her car when she left sometime between 10 p.m. and 10.30 p.m. A resident delivering newspapers in the area on the morning of November 3rd, between 3.30 and 4 a.m. reported, seeing a light-colored SUV parked either in Michelle's yard or on the street in front of her house. Another resident was walking by at about 6.15 a.m. and noticed an empty SUV parked at the edge of the driveway. Police investigated Jason's movements, revealing that after leaving his Raleigh residence on November 2nd to travel to Virginia, he stopped at a gas station in Raleigh around 7.30 p.m. Jason drove a white Ford Explorer and contacted his mother, Pat Young, informing her of his intention to check with Michelle about the possibility of staying over at Pat's house on Friday night during his return from the business trip. Pat resided in Brevard, and Jason planned to collect some furniture she wanted to give him. Following his call to his mother, Jason continued his journey to Virginia, stopping for food at a Cracker Barrel restaurant in Greensboro at 9.25 p.m. Later, he checked into a Hampton Inn at 10.54 p.m., using a key card to enter his room at 10.56 p.m., Although he utilized express checkout the next morning, the exact departure time from the hotel remained unconfirmed. A call Jason made to his mother at 7.40 a.m. on November 3rd, using a cell tower near Wytheville, Virginia, placed him in the state. He arrived at the sales call in Clintwood, albeit 30 minutes behind schedule. Despite surveillance footage and the key card indicating that Jason did not leave his hotel room after midnight, police were skeptical. Further analysis of the footage led them to suspect tampering, believing Jason may have driven back to Raleigh after midnight to commit the crime against Michelle and then returned to Virginia. Upon examining the Young's computer, investigators discovered internet searches related to the anatomy of a knockout, head trauma blackout, head blow knockout, and head trauma, 
though the exact timing of these searches remained undetermined. Two years after Michelle's body was discovered, Jason was charged with first-degree murder and entered a plea of not guilty. The prosecution built its case around the assertion that Jason and Michelle experienced marital and financial difficulties, with Jason allegedly desiring to end the marriage. Multiple affairs were brought to light during the trial as evidence of strained relations. According to the prosecution, after checking into the Hampton Inn in Hillsville, Virginia, they claimed Jason left the hotel during the night, returned to Raleigh, and committed the murder. They argued that he manipulated the hotel's surveillance camera and made a stop for gas at a station between Hillsville and Raleigh. The prosecution presented to the jury the theory that Michelle was strangled and beaten to death, and her two-year-old daughter Cassidy was left alone in the house with her mother's lifeless body for an extended period. The crime scene revealed Cassidy's small, bloody footprints scattered throughout the residence. During the trial, the jury was presented with surveillance footage from the Hampton Inn, starting from 10.49 p.m. on the 2nd of November. However, the footage went black at 11.20 p.m., leading the prosecution to argue that Jason tampered with the camera. They alleged that he did so to prop open the security door, allowing him to exit without using his key card. A hotel employee discovered that the first floor emergency door, leading from the western stairwell to the exterior of the hotel, was propped open with a small red rock. Normally, this door remained locked between 11 p.m. and 6 a.m. Upon further inspection, Keith noticed that the camera in the stairwell closest to the propped open door was not functioning, while the other cameras were operational. The last image captured by that camera was at 11.20 p.m. on the 2nd of November. Although staff members later plugged the camera back in at 5.50 a.m. on the 3rd of November, someone redirected it toward the ceiling between 6.34 a.m. and 6.35 a.m. The prosecution argued that this sequence of events suggested that Jason unplugged the camera and left the door ajar, creating an alibi for himself while he returned home to commit the crime against his wife. The prosecution asserted that Jason made a stop at a gas station in North Carolina around 5 a.m. on his way back to Virginia. The gas attendant testified in court, stating that she believed the person who visited the gas station that morning was Jason. She vividly recalled the encounter, explaining, I don't forget nothing like that when somebody is cussing and fussing at me. According to Gracie's testimony, a man in a white SUV parked at the farthest pump attempted multiple times to pump gas. Frustrated, he entered the store and verbally abused Gracie because the pump wasn't working. She informed him that, at that early hour, customers needed to provide money or identification before activating the gasoline pumps. To resolve the situation, the man handed her $20, pumped $15 worth of gasoline into his vehicle, and promptly drove away without returning to the store for his change. Gracie's account was presented as evidence to support the prosecution's case. During the trial, details of Jason and Michelle's marriage were brought to light. Some acquaintances believed that their union occurred primarily because Michelle became pregnant with their first child. Meredith Fisher, Michelle's sister-in-law, testified that she advised Michelle to leave Jason, but Michelle made no effort to pursue a divorce. Three weeks before Michelle's death, Jason allegedly told a friend that he was done. The court also learned that the couple frequently argued about Michelle's mother, Linda. Linda often visited her daughter for extended periods, expressing a desire to move to North Carolina to spend more time with Michelle and her granddaughter. Linda even offered to renovate their house to accommodate her presence. While Michelle was content with this arrangement, Jason was not. Linda, Michelle's mother, testified in court about the moment she learned of her daughter's death. According to Linda, her other daughter, Meredith, called and spelled out, Mom, Michelle is dead! Linda initially inquired if Michelle had merely passed out, but Meredith confirmed that Michelle was indeed dead. Linda recounted attempting to contact Jason, but her calls went unanswered and he never returned them. Linda's testimony revealed a tumultuous relationship between Jason and Michelle, with Linda witnessing numerous fights and Jason allegedly belittling Michelle. 
Linda informed the court that she advised Michelle to leave Jason, but Michelle was determined to salvage the marriage. According to Linda, Michelle confided in her that Jason didn't make love to her and had a perverted approach to intimacy. Linda also testified that Jason would have female friends stay over at the house when Michelle was away on business trips. Expressing her sorrow, Linda told the jury, she had so much to offer. There was so much about Michelle that was just, she was an NC State cheerleader. I mean, she had that pep, that energy, that vivacious, you know, she loved life and he took it away from her, just took it away from her. After Michelle's funeral, Jason moved into his parents' house with their daughter, Cassidy. Linda hired a lawyer to facilitate visitation with Cassidy, and after legal proceedings, full custody was granted to Meredith. Linda believed that Jason wanted no further questions asked. During the trial, one of Jason's female friends, Carol Ann Sowerby, testified that she had known Jason since their teenage years. She visited him in the fall of 2006, just 10 days before Michelle's death, and admitted to having sexual relations with Jason on the living room couch one night while Michelle was out of town. Carol also claimed that Jason took her wedding ring, pretending to swallow it, but returned it the next day. The court also received testimony from another female friend, Michelle Money, who was one of Michelle Young's college sorority sisters. Michelle Money believed that her own husband was unfaithful, and she disclosed that she first met Jason at his wedding. Their contact increased towards the end of September 2006, and Jason visited Michelle Money in Orlando in October of that year, during which they engaged in a sexual relationship. Jason reportedly told a friend that he was in love with Michelle Money. Throughout October, they maintained constant communication, exchanging messages 980 times in one month. The day before Michelle's murder, they were in contact 51 times in a single day. Michelle Money was the last person Jason contacted on the 2nd of November and the first person he called on the morning of the 3rd of November. Michelle Money testified, stating, We would talk regularly about work and life and kids. The court also heard about the severe injuries Michelle sustained. Dr. Thomas Clark, who conducted the autopsy, testified that Michelle died from blunt force trauma to her head, having endured at least 30 blows, with the most serious inflicted by a heavy blunt object featuring a rounded surface causing crescent-shaped skull fractures. Dr. Clark also noted signs of strangulation as Michelle suffered a broken jaw, skull fractures, brain hemorrhaging, lacerations, abrasions, and dislodged teeth. The court was informed that there was no evidence indicating that Jason had previously physically assaulted Michelle. However, the prosecution asserted to the jury that even if this were true, it didn't rule out the possibility that he assaulted her on the specific night in question. Their argument was based on the belief that Jason had the capacity for physical violence, and they brought in his former fiancée, Genevieve Cargol, as a witness. Genevieve attested that she herself had been a victim of domestic violence at Jason's hands. One notable incident she described occurred at a Texas wedding, where Jason, in an intoxicated state, forcibly took off her engagement ring during an argument about his level of intoxication. According to Genevieve, the ring was too small and tight on her finger, and when she couldn't remove it, Jason, agitated, took it off forcefully. She recounted to the court, I had never seen him like that before. His eyes were completely empty and deserted, glazed over as if he wasn't seeing me. Genevieve asserted that the incident mentioned earlier was not an isolated occurrence. She recounted another episode where Jason, in a fit of anger, punched the windshield of her car with his bare hand, causing damage. Additionally, he had punched a wall in their apartment, resulting in further property damage. After several years of no contact, Genevieve received an email from Jason on September 12, 2006, expressing his love for her. The defense contended that the prosecution lacked credible evidence against their client. They highlighted that Jason's DNA and fingerprints were naturally found in the bedroom, but none of his fingerprints were blood-stained. Moreover, there was no blood discovered in his car, on his clothing, or in the Virginia hotel room where he stayed. 
During the police examination, Jason was found to have no cuts, bruises, or other injuries on his hands or body, except for a bruised and broken toenail. When given the opportunity to testify, Jason admitted that he was not a perfect husband, but claimed to be actively working on improving his marriage. He vehemently denied any involvement in Michelle's murder. The court learned about the existing issues in Jason and Michelle's marriage, but also heard that Jason genuinely loved his wife and was committed to making the relationship succeed. Excitement surrounded the impending birth of their baby boy, and emails exchanged on October 24, 2006, indicated Jason's willingness to attend counseling sessions. According to Jason, he didn't believe their arguments were more frequent than those in other couples. The defense contended that Jason wouldn't have had sufficient time to travel back to Raleigh, commit the murder, and return to Virginia, given that the hotel was approximately 160 miles from their home. Jason had recently started a new job involving electronic health record software sales, and he was in Virginia because his employer had scheduled an early morning sales call in Clintwood on November 3rd. To avoid driving from Raleigh on the day of the call, Jason opted to stay overnight. Nervous about the upcoming meeting, he spent the evening reviewing the demonstration software he intended to use during the presentation. In court, Jason stated that he left his hotel room to retrieve his laptop charger from his car, but realized he had left the key card inside. He propped the exit door open, went back to his room, and then left again to smoke a cigar. He also went to the front desk to get a copy of USA Today, propping the exit door open once more for his cigar break. When questioned about being 30 minutes late to his sales call in Clintwood, Jason claimed that he got lost. Regarding the internet searches found on his computer, Jason explained that they were conducted at a different time and were related to an accident he had witnessed. Despite the jury's deliberation, they couldn't reach a unanimous verdict, resulting in a hung jury with an 8-4 to four vote for acquittal. Jason faced a second trial where he didn't testify, but a video of his testimony from the first trial was played. The second jury deliberated for six hours before finding him guilty of first-degree murder. Jason was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Jason appealed his conviction, and during the appeal hearing, his new legal team argued that his trial attorney should have objected more strongly when the judge allowed jurors to hear about Jason's lack of response to a civil wrongful death lawsuit, which found him responsible for his wife's murder. A civil lawsuit had been brought against Jason by Michelle's family between the two criminal trials, and he was deemed responsible for Michelle's death in that civil suit. Jason's attorney contended that the jury should not have been made aware of this information. They also argued that the same judge, Superior Court Judge Donald Stevens, presided over both the civil case and the second criminal trial, potentially biasing the jury against Jason. The appeals court agreed with Jason's arguments. A unanimous panel of the Court of Appeals vacated his conviction and ordered a new trial, which would have been his third. However, before a third trial could take place, a state Court of Appeals panel reversed the Court of Appeals decision. Consequently, Jason did not face a third trial, and his conviction for first-degree murder stood. In the civil wrongful death suit, Michelle's family was awarded $15.5 million in damages. Lacey Peterson was born on May 4, 1975, to Sharon Anderson and Dennis Robert Rocha. Her parents met in high school and owned a dairy farm located west of Escalon, California. She also had an older brother. Growing up, Lassie actively participated in farm work from a young age and shared a love for gardening with her mother. Following her parents' divorce during her childhood, Sharon and the children relocated to Modesto, although they continued to visit the dairy farm on weekends. Sharon later married a second time, who played a role in raising Lassie and her brother since Lacey was two years old. During her school years, Lacey was a cheerleader in both junior high and high school. After graduating from Thomas Downey High School, she pursued higher education at California Polytechnic State University, where she focused on ornamental horticulture. While studying, she encountered Scott, 
a handsome and ambitious individual aspiring to become a professional golfer. While enrolled at California Polytechnic, Scott worked at Pacific Cafe, a restaurant in Morro Bay. Lassie would occasionally visit the establishment to see a friend who also worked there. In the mid-1990s, Lacey took the initiative to send Scott her phone number, expressing to her mother that she had met the man she intended to marry. Following Scott's call, they embarked on a dating relationship. As their connection deepened, Scott made the decision to set aside his aspirations in professional golf, redirecting his focus toward a career in business. The couple dated for two years and eventually moved in together. In 1997, after Lassie graduated, they celebrated their wedding at Sycamore Mineral Springs Resort. While Scott completed his senior year, Lacey secured a job in nearby Prunedale. Scott successfully graduated with a Bachelor of Science degree in Agricultural Business in June 1998, and the Petersons embarked on an entrepreneurial venture, opening a sports bar in San Luis Obispo named The Shack. Lassie took on a role as front-of-house staff while Scott handled all the cooking duties. Upon deciding to start a family and relocating to Lassie's hometown of Modesto, California, they put the shack up for sale, finalizing the sale in April 2001. In October 2000, the Petersons acquired a three-bedroom, two-bath bungalow on Covena Avenue for $177,000, situated in an upscale neighborhood near East La Loma Park. Upon purchasing the house, they promptly undertook remodeling efforts, adding a swimming pool and a built-in barbecue. Their intention was to create a space where they could happily spend time hosting friends and organizing dinner parties. Lacey took on a part-time role as a substitute teacher, while Scott secured employment with Trade Corp USA, a recently established subsidiary of a European fertilizer company, earning a monthly salary of $5,000 before taxes. Their friends and family viewed them as having an ideal marriage, a perception that was heightened when Lassie, two years after moving into their new home, joyfully discovered she was pregnant. With their nursery prepared for the imminent arrival of their baby boy, whom they named Connor, the Christmas of 2002 was anticipated to be a particularly special one for the couple. However, the festive excitement took a tragic turn when Lacey was reported missing on Christmas Eve. On the 24th of December 2002, Scott informed the police that he returned home around 4.30 p.m. after a day of fishing. Originally scheduled to meet Lassie at home by 4 p.m. for a dinner outing with Lacey's mother, Sharon, Scott claimed to have left the house before 10 a.m. that morning. He made a stop at his warehouse to retrieve his boat, spending about an hour there before heading to Berkeley Marina with his recently purchased 14-foot aluminum boat. Upon reaching Berkeley Marina, Scott informed the police that he spent approximately an hour on the water, heading north towards Brooks Island. Around 2.15 p.m., he returned the boat to the trailer and headed back to Modesto. During the journey home, he attempted to call Lassie, but there was no answer. Upon arriving at his warehouse, he dropped off the boat and headed home. Upon reaching their house, Scott noticed Lacey's car in the driveway leading him to believe she was home. However, he found it odd that their golden retriever, Mackenzie, was outside in the backyard with his leash on. The back patio doors were unlocked and Lacey was nowhere to be found. Scott, feeling increasingly concerned, had some pizza and milk, washed his wet clothes and took a shower. Still unable to locate Lacey, he reached out to Sharon, Lacey's sister Amy and friends, but none had seen her. Scott went on to knock on doors in the neighborhood, but no one had information about Lacey's whereabouts. With no sign of Lacey, Scott reported her missing to the police. Following Lacey Peterson's disappearance, the Modesto police and firefighters initiated an extensive search along Dry Creek on the following day. The search efforts included helicopters equipped with searchlights, police mounted on horseback and bicycles, canine units, and water rescue units on rafts. A total of 30 officers, along with Lacey's loved ones and volunteers, participated in the search, with the latter group posting flyers to raise awareness of her disappearance. Detective Al Brocchini, speaking at a press conference, 
emphasized that they did not believe Lassie would leave without contacting her family, as it was considered completely out of character for her. The initial search and subsequent vigil were organized by Lassie's immediate family and friends, with up to 900 people involved in the first two days before community officials and police joined the efforts. The story eventually gained nationwide media attention. To aid in the search, a $25,000 reward was initially offered, later increased to $250,000, and eventually raised to $500,000 for any information leading to Lassie's safe return. Posters, blue and yellow ribbons, and flyers were distributed. A command center was set up at a nearby Red Lion Hotel by friends, family, and volunteers to record developments and disseminate information. Over 1,500 volunteers signed up to distribute information and assist in the search efforts. Lacey's family and friends were gripped with fear, suspecting she might have been abducted during her morning walk with Mackenzie. Typically, Lacey walked the dog in the vicinity of East La Loma Park near their residence, following a consistent route. She would walk towards the tennis courts and then return home. This routine usually took about 45 minutes. On that fateful morning, Scott informed the police that Lassie had planned to do some grocery shopping and take a walk. When he left, everything seemed normal. Lacey had begun her day at 7 a.m., watching TV, tidying up a bit, and spending some time with Scott watching Martha Stewart. At the time of Scott's departure, Lacey was dressed in black maternity pants, a white t-shirt, and white tennis shoes. In an effort to locate Lacey, Scott, Sharon, Amy, and other friends and family gathered at East La Loma Park, retracing the route she typically took. Unfortunately, their search yielded no results. A neighbor, Karen Service, reported finding Mackenzie on the street with his leash on at 10.18 a.m. that morning. The leash was damp and covered in leaves and grass clippings. She placed the dog in the Peterson's backyard and secured the gate. While the police conducted a search of the Peterson house, no evidence of foul play was discovered. Lassie's friends and family attested that there was nothing unusual that might have compelled her to leave. The evening before, on December 23rd at 5.45 p.m., Lacey and Scott had met with Amy at her hair salon for a haircut. During her salon visit, Lacey ordered a pizza to pick up on the way home. Scott invited Amy to join them for dinner, but she already had plans. According to those present, Lacey exhibited her normal, happy demeanor. Upon returning home, Lacey called Sharon around 8.30 p.m. to discuss plans for the upcoming Christmas Eve dinner, and her sudden disappearance remained a perplexing mystery. However, a few days later, on December 30th, a significant development occurred in the case. The seemingly perfect husband, Scott Peterson, was harboring a significant secret. A 28-year-old woman named Amber Frey contacted the police, revealing that she was Scott's girlfriend. According to Amber, Scott had informed her that his wife was deceased. Some individuals had already expressed concerns about Scott, noting that he appeared less worried about Lacey's disappearance than expected. Allegedly, he was seen laughing and maintaining a relaxed demeanor during some of the searches for her. Amber, a massage therapist and single mother residing in Fresno, agreed to cooperate with the police by continuing to engage in conversations with Scott and recording their telephone interactions. During these calls, Scott appeared nonchalant and flirtatious. Subsequently, the police conducted a search of Scott's warehouse and boat, where they discovered a pair of needle-nosed pliers. In the clamping part of the pliers, they found a single hair fragment measuring five, six inches in length and dark in color. This hair was consistent with samples found in Lassie's hairbrush. The revelation of Scott's extramarital affair and the discovery of potential evidence added a new dimension to the investigation into Lassie Peterson's disappearance. Nearly four months after Lacey was reported missing, a heart-wrenching discovery was made by a woman walking her dog. On April 13, 2003, the body of Connor Peterson, Lacey's unborn son, was found on the shore of San Francisco Bay, almost one mile northeast of Brooks Island. Strikingly, the umbilical cord was still attached. 
The following day, on April 14th, the body of Lacey Peterson was discovered on the shore, nearly two miles northeast of Brooks Island. The geographical significance of these findings was notable, as Brooks Island was the location Scott had claimed to be fishing on Christmas Eve when Lassie disappeared. Scott Peterson was arrested on April 18, 2003, near a Lahoa golf course, where he claimed he was meeting his father and brother for a golf game. At the time of his arrest, his naturally dark brown hair had been dyed blonde. His Mercedes was found overstuffed with various items, including nearly $15,000 USD in cash, survival gear, camping equipment, several changes of clothes, four cell phones, and two driver's licenses, his own and his brother's. Scott's father, Lee Peterson, explained that Scott had used his brother's license the day before to obtain a San Diego resident discount at the golf course and that Scott had been living out of his car due to media attention. However, police and prosecutors interpreted these items as indications that Scott had planned to flee to Mexico. On April 21st, 2003, Scott faced two felony counts of murder with premeditation and special circumstances. Scott pleaded not guilty to the charges. The prosecution contended that Scott was responsible for Lacey's death, acknowledging their inability to pinpoint the exact time, location, or method of the murder. Nevertheless, they asserted possessing sufficient evidence to establish his guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. According to their argument, trouble arose in November 2002 when Scott initiated an affair with Amber, seeking more excitement in his life beyond his monotonous job, mundane marriage, and parental responsibilities. They asserted that Scott's interest in saltwater fishing in December 2002 marked the commencement of his plan to murder his wife. The prosecution alleged that when Scott left home on the morning of December 24th to drive to Berkeley Marina, he had already killed Lassie. They claimed he likely suffocated her either on the night of December 23rd or early on December 24th. According to their case, Scott wrapped Lacey's body in a blue tarp, placed it in the back of his truck's toolbox, and transported it to his warehouse. A strand of Lacey's hair caught in his yellow-handled needle-nose pliers. At the warehouse, he attached homemade cement anchors to the body, loaded it onto his 14-foot Sears Roebuck boat, and towed it to Berkeley Marina, where he allegedly disposed of Lacey's body, weighted by anchors in the bay. The prosecution further claimed that Scott staged the scene by putting a leash on the dog, Mackenzie, to create the appearance of an abduction. The jury listened to recorded phone conversations between Scott and Amber, revealing that shortly after Lacey's disappearance, he continued to flatter and flirt with Amber, promising her an exciting life together. The defense contended that Scott Peterson was innocent, asserting that Lacey might have been abducted by unknown individuals. They argued that whoever kidnapped and murdered Lacey disposed of her body at Brooks Island, anticipating that Scott would be wrongfully implicated. The extensive media coverage and public attention surrounding the case had already established Scott's whereabouts on that day long before the discovery of the bodies. The defense's stance was grounded in the absence of a murder weapon, crime scene, confession, and emphasized the presence of numerous theories in the case. Additionally, the defense presented the argument that an eyewitness observed Lashi engaging with men across the street on the morning of the 24th. A house opposite the Peterson residence was reportedly burglarized at 10.30 a.m. on December 24th. Furthermore, they pointed to other accounts suggesting that Lashi was seen walking the dog, Mackenzie, after Scott had already left for his fishing trip. The defense asserted that Lacey was alive when Scott left on the morning in question, emphasizing the crucial aspect of determining the exact time of Lassi and Connor's deaths. Dr. Charles March, their witness and a fertility expert, testified that Connor Peterson likely died after December 24th. This argument suggested Scott's innocence as he was under police surveillance during that period. However, during cross-examination, Dr. March acknowledged the possibility of error in stating that Connor Peterson was born alive around December 29th. Notably, Scott Peterson was not called to testify. Scott Peterson was ultimately found guilty of first-degree murder for his wife's death 
with special circumstances due to dumping her body in the San Francisco Bay, making him eligible for the death penalty. He was also found guilty of second-degree murder for Connor's death. The jury then faced the decision of sentencing Scott to life in prison without parole or the death penalty by lethal injection. Second-degree murder carries a punishment of at least 15 years to life in prison. During the deliberation process, the jury requested autopsy photographs of Lassie and Connor, whose body was found in San Francisco Bay without limbs or a head. The foreman explained the importance of viewing the photographs for their decision-making process. Ultimately, the jury chose the death penalty for Scott Peterson. He arrived at San Quentin State Prison in the early morning hours of Wednesday, March 17, 2005. Reports indicated that he had not slept the night before, describing himself as too jazzed to sleep. He became one of over 700 inmates in California's sole death row facility, where individuals are housed during the appeals process. Scott Peterson's automatic appeal of his death sentence was officially filed in the Supreme Court of California on July 5, 2012. The subsequent day, Scott's attorney, Cliff Gardner, submitted a 423-page brief challenging the sentence. The defense argued that factors such as extensive trial publicity, incorrect evidentiary rulings, and other errors deprived Scott of a fair trial. The state attorney general's office filed their response brief on January 26, 2015. In July 2015, the defense filed a response to the state's brief highlighting issues such as the reliability of a certified dog that detected Lacey's scent at Berkeley Marina, noting it had failed two-thirds of tests under similar conditions. In June 2020, the California Supreme Court conducted hearings on Scott's direct appeal. The defense argued that prospective jurors were improperly excused, that the trial judge improperly allowed two jurors onto Scott's boat, that the judge erred in insisting the prosecution be present during defense testing of the boat, and that the motion to move the trial to another county should have been granted due to juror questionnaire results showing almost half of the prospective jurors had already concluded Scott was guilty prior to the trial. On August 24, 2020, the Supreme Court of California, in a unanimous 7-0 decision, upheld Scott Peterson's conviction, but overturned his death sentence. The court found that Scott's trial judge had improperly dismissed jurors who opposed capital punishment without determining if they could set aside their views. Initially, prosecutors indicated their intention to retry the penalty phase, but they later reversed this decision in June 2021. On September 22, 2021, California Superior Court judge ruled that Scott would be resentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. In December of the same year, the judge conducted a hearing and officially resentenced Scott to life in prison without parole for the first-degree murder of Lassie and a concurrent sentence of 15 years to life for the second-degree murder of Connor. In October 2022, Scott was relocated from San Quentin's death row to Mule Creek State Prison in Ione, California. Gail Katz, born on March 8, 1956, in Brooklyn, New York, grew up in a family with two additional siblings, a sister and a brother. Despite excelling academically as a teenager and graduating a year ahead of her peers, Gail's path took a different turn when she entered college. Instead of maintaining her academic success, she became engrossed in a lifestyle of partying, leading to her eventual decision to drop out. This choice deeply disappointed her conservative parents, who held traditional views on life. They believed that Gail's only prospect for a successful future was to marry a wealthy man. Gail's mother, employed in the hospital emergency department, strongly advocated for her to pursue a doctor as a life partner, but Gail resisted choosing to prioritize socializing and dating over a committed relationship. Eventually, Gail lost control of her life, grappling with depression and attempting suicide multiple times. Despite the initial surprise of her family, Gail introduced them to a man named Robert Bierenbaum, whom mutual friends had connected them with. Dr. Robert Bierenbaum, a young and promising individual, 
appeared to be an ideal match for both Gail and her family. Coming from a successful cardiologist father, he pursued a career in medicine, completing his residency as a plastic surgeon at Brooklyn Maimonides Medical Center. Beyond his impressive educational background, Robert possessed charm, linguistic skills, and a love for skiing, but his greatest passion lay in aviation. He held a pilot's license and often arranged romantic airborne dates for Gail. She relished these adventures, and he appreciated her genuine interest in his passions. Consequently, their bond deepened rapidly, leading to their eventual marriage. However, as with many love stories, theirs did not culminate in a happily ever after. On July 7, 1985, a Sunday, Robert Bierenbaum arrived alone at his sister's residence in Montclair, New Jersey, USA, around 6.30 p.m. The occasion was his nephew's birthday, and his sister hosted a celebration for him. Both Robert and his wife, Gail Katz, were invited to the gathering. However, Robert informed his sister and father that Gail was not accompanying him due to an earlier disagreement they had that day. According to Robert, Gail had left their Manhattan apartment around 11 a.m. to visit Central Park, and she had not returned home by the time he left for the party, prompting him to attend alone. On his way back from the celebration, Robert made a stop at the residence of his friend, Dr. Scott Baranoff. At this point, Robert appeared distressed and attempted to reach his apartment's landline multiple times without success. He confided in Scott about the morning's argument with Gail, mentioning that she had left wearing casual attire and had not been in contact with him since. Upon returning to his Manhattan apartment, Robert found Gail absent. He contacted her former psychology teacher, Dr. Yvette Face, to discuss the argument. Robert informed Yvette that Gail had left earlier in the day to sunbathe at Central Park. Yvette advised him to inform the police and inquire with the apartment complex's doorman regarding Gail's whereabouts, to which Robert agreed he would do. The following evening on July 8th at 9 p.m., Robert reached out to Detective Virgilio Dalsas for the first time. He informed the detective that Gail had left their apartment at 11 a.m. the previous day, and he hadn't had any contact with her since. Robert explained that he had waited for Gail at their apartment until 5.30 p.m., but she didn't return, prompting him to leave for his nephew's party at his sister's house. As Robert was the last person known to have seen Gail, the detective urged him to provide all the details he could to aid in finding her. Robert mentioned to the detective that Gail had previously attempted to take her own life. He also expressed concerns to friends that Gail might have harmed herself, citing information from her therapist, Dr. Sybil Baran, who had allegedly informed him about Gail's suicidal tendencies. The search for Gail commenced, but the police faced significant challenges due to the lack of substantial leads. Despite their efforts to gather more information from Robert, he did not respond to their repeated messages until July 10th, days after reporting her missing. During this conversation with Detective O'Malley, Robert inquired about the progress of the investigation and agreed to meet three days later to revisit the details of the last day he saw Gail. As time passed, police grew increasingly suspicious that Robert might be withholding crucial information. Several incidents troubled them, including an encounter on July 14th when some of Gail's friends, including Marianne Desassar, were actively searching for her and distributing missing person posters. During this interaction, Robert suggested to Marianne that he believed Gail was on a week-long shopping spree at Bloomingdale's, a statement that raised red flags for investigators. Additionally, on another occasion, he mentioned to Gail's mother an odd comment about the cat falling ill and needing the rug cleaned. They found it peculiar. The details he recounted regarding the events of July 7th varied depending on who he spoke to. Interestingly, he didn't inform the police about the argument he had with Gail on Sunday morning before her departure at 11 a.m., despite having mentioned it to his family and some friends. Instead, he informed the police that the argument took place the night before she went missing, citing financial matters as the cause. 
He asserted that they reconciled afterward, even mentioning a romantic dinner he prepared for Gail upon their return to their apartment on July 6th, stating that she went to Central Park the next morning at 11 a.m. Despite repeated questioning by the police to ensure he disclosed all events of July 7th, he maintained that he remained in the apartment until leaving for the party at 5.30 p.m. However, this conflicted starkly with what he told Gail's friends, claiming he searched for her in Central Park between 11 a.m. and 5.30 p.m., even alleging finding her towel and suntan oil there. Remarkably, despite the significance of this information to Gail's disappearance, he did not share it with the police. Robert informed the detective that he had spoken to the doorman at their apartment complex, who remembered seeing Gail leave at 11 a.m. but not returning. However, when questioned by the police, the doorman claimed he didn't see Robert or Gail that day. Moreover, when Detective Dalsas requested to search the apartment in July after Gail's initial disappearance report, Robert only responded to the request on September 12th and allowed entry on September 30th, but with limitations. The police were not permitted to conduct searches for blood or hair samples. As suspicion regarding Robert's potential involvement in Gail's disappearance grew, the police delved into the state of their marriage, discovering a far from perfect relationship described as toxic by acquaintances. Their relationship wasn't always tumultuous. They met in the early 80s when Gail was in college and Robert was a surgical resident in Manhattan. Initially, Robert went to great lengths to impress Gail, showcasing his skills as a pilot and his proficiency in multiple languages, appearing very romantic. Their relationship was even described as magical in the beginning. However, things took a turn, and they began arguing more frequently in the months leading up to Gail's disappearance. Gail's sister, Elaine Katz, recounted to the police an incident where she witnessed Robert forcefully feeding food to Gail at a restaurant, which deeply unsettled her. This was just one of several concerning occurrences discovered by the police. Both friends and family described Robert as controlling, and Gail confided in a neighbor that she felt uneasy at home. Gail had previously reported an incident to the police, where she alleged that Robert choked her into unconsciousness after catching her smoking on the balcony. Although Gail stayed with Robert after he agreed to see a psychiatrist, the psychiatrist later sent her a letter cautioning her that Robert might pose a serious threat to her life. Shortly before Gail was reported missing, she had started a new relationship and had decided to leave Robert. She confided in a friend that she planned to inform him of her decision to leave and file for divorce on July 7th. She also mentioned that if Robert refused to cooperate and agree to a settlement, she would reveal the letter she received from his psychiatrist warning her about the potential danger he posed, even considering showing it to his colleagues. The police found that the accumulation of circumstantial evidence pointed to Robert's involvement in Gail's disappearance. However, a significant obstacle remained. Gail had yet to be located. The search for Gail continued as her family and friends persisted in their efforts to uncover the truth about her disappearance. However, Robert appeared unconcerned. He spent considerable time in the Hamptons, attending various parties and initiating relationships with other women. In September 1985, a woman named Dr. Roberta Karnofsky moved in with him at their marital home, and they were in a relationship for about a year. Throughout this period, despite ongoing efforts, no trace of Gale was found, and no arrests were made. Although no arrests had been made, Gale's disappearance remained an active and open investigation, with Chief Investigator Detective Andy Rosenzweig revisiting the evidence. Aware of Robert's passion for flying and his status as a licensed pilot, Detective Rosenzweig focused on checking flight logs at the New Jersey airport. It was known that Robert often rented planes from there. Investigation into the records revealed that on July 7, 1985, Robert rented a Cessna 172 plane at Caldwell Airport in Fairfield, New Jersey at 4.30 p.m., returning it after one hour and 56 minutes. However, Robert had altered the date on his own flight log to the following day, July 8th. 
Detective Rosenzweig's discovery raised questions. Why did Robert attempt to conceal this flight? Detective Rosenzweig strongly suspected that Robert was responsible for Gail's death, theorizing that he had killed her and disposed of her body in the Atlantic Ocean. Robert's flight records indicated that he had sufficient time to make a round trip of approximately 165 miles over a portion of the ocean. However, lacking Gail's body, the district attorney's office felt there wasn't adequate evidence to secure a conviction. Four years after Gail's disappearance in May 1989, a torso washed up on Staten Island. At that time, DNA testing was not yet available. Instead, an X-ray technician compared an old chest X-ray with the torso and confirmed it belonged to Gail. The torso was released to her family, who held a burial service for Gail. Despite this identification, no charges were filed, and Robert relocated to Las Vegas, where he established a successful plastic surgery practice, continued dating, and became well-regarded in the community. In 1996, he married Janet Shallot, and they later moved to North Dakota, where they had a daughter. Despite Robert's apparent moving on, Detective Rosenzweig remained haunted by the unsolved case of Gail's disappearance and decided to revisit it a decade later when forensic DNA analysis had become available. With Gail's family's consent, the torso was exhumed for testing, which ultimately revealed that it did not belong to Gail. Despite the absence of Gail's body, the police and the DA's office believed they had sufficient evidence to arrest and charge Robert with second-degree murder. Robert pleaded not guilty to the charges. The case against Robert relied solely on circumstantial evidence. No eyewitnesses, forensic evidence, confession, or body were present. Nonetheless, the prosecution argued that despite the circumstantial nature of the evidence, it unmistakably pointed to one conclusion, Robert's guilt in Gail's murder. They contended that he killed Gail in their apartment upon learning of her intention to leave him. According to the police, Robert then spent hours dismembering Gail's body before flying a plane over the ocean to dispose of it between Montauk Point, New York, and Cape May, New Jersey. The prosecution's task was to convince the jury that it was feasible for Robert to dispose of the body while piloting the plane, alleging that he acted alone. They presented four expert witnesses and a video demonstrating how such an act could be accomplished to support their argument. The jury received testimony from four expert witnesses, New York City's chief medical examiner, a seasoned New York City police pilot, an aviation safety inspector, and an airline transport pilot flight instructor FAA flight test examiner. They asserted that Robert, a surgical resident and pilot, could feasibly dismember a body the size of Gales, five feet, three in tall, 110 pounds, within a mere 10 minutes. They further testified that he could pack her dismembered limbs into a flight bag and transport them through an unmonitored rear exit of his apartment building, then walk two blocks to his car unnoticed. The experts also stated that Robert could load the flight bag onto the Cessna 172 plane without detection, piloting it over the Atlantic Ocean to dispose of Gale's remains. They noted that the rented plane was relatively straightforward to operate. The prosecution presented evidence of a motive to the jury, revealing Gale's affair and her desire to leave Robert. She had made plans, borrowed money, and was determined to depart on July 7th. The court learned that Robert failed to inform anyone, not even his family, of his flying activities on that day. The altered flight log was presented as evidence, suggesting he flew on the following day instead. The court was informed about the tumultuous nature of Robert and Gail's relationship, including allegations of domestic violence. Robert himself had previously described their arguments as intense and volatile. There were accounts of him expressing hatred towards Gail and making statements indicating a desire to harm her. Testimony revealed both direct threats and perceived threats made by Robert. In the autumn of 1983, Gail contacted her cousin, Hillard Wees, an attorney, and disclosed that she and Robert had a heated argument during which he choked her, rendering her unconscious for the first time, although it wasn't the first instance of him choking her. 
Additionally, Gale's therapist, Dr. Sybil Baran, provided testimony. Contrary to Robert's claims that Gale was suicidal, Dr. Baran informed the jury that she had never discussed such concerns with Robert and did not believe Gale was suicidal. The defense contended that Robert was innocent, presenting Gale as someone with mental health challenges, a drug dependency, and unstable relationships with other men. They called a witness who claimed to have seen Gale in a bagel shop days after her disappearance. However, the prosecution highlighted to the jury that the witness's description of the woman did not match Gale's. After deliberating for five and a half hours, the jury found Robert guilty of second-degree murder. Consequently, he was sentenced to 20 years to life in prison. Robert appealed the verdict, but was ultimately unsuccessful in overturning it. After completing 20 years of his sentence, Robert made a confession for the first time during a 2020 parole board hearing. He admitted to killing Gail and disposing of her body by throwing it out of an airplane, aligning with the prosecution's theory of events. Robert recounted that they argued and he became overwhelmed, ultimately attacking and strangling Gail. He then proceeded to fly an airplane, open the door, and discard her body over the ocean. When questioned about his motive for the murder, Robert attributed it to his immaturity and inability to manage his anger effectively. Despite his confession, Gail's body has never been recovered. What do you think of today's story? Write your opinion about this case in the comments. I thank you for your attention and recommend subscribing to the channel as well as clicking on the bell to not miss new videos that are released daily. Take care of yourself and your loved ones. See you soon.